Welcome to I'm Spiritual Damn It. I'm your host, Jennifer Weigel, and joining me on the line, we have the very talented author, intuitive, holographic shaman, uh, life strategist, and teacher, Robert Ohato. Did I miss anything, Robert? I think you covered most of it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Unless you're a feng shui expert now or something, we got to tack no. on that at the end, okay? <laughs> you can leave that out. You can okay. leave that out. That's the only thing you don't do. Um, but I also okay. know you have um, astrology. Uh, there's so many things under your belt, and I'm just so grateful to have you on the conversation. So thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, I am fascinated to know... And of course, because I've been inhaling your work for a while now, I know this. But to the listeners who aren't familiar with your journey, explain to them how you became clued in to all of your intuitive gifts. Uh, wow, that's a huge question. It, it kind of evolved um, over you know my whole life, really. I, I when I was younger, I had uh, an insight into people. I just sort of knew mm -hmm. what was making people tick. Um, very instinctively. And uh, so when I was, I remember being in Taekwondo, I was like 12 or 13. I, they called me little, little Buddha because people would come for advice on relationships and stuff. And I would just have these answers for them. And I, I'm not exactly sure where that came from. It's just sort of an inner, an inner knowing that's, that's one half of, I think um, something I, I think I really brought into this life with me. But at the same time, um, in this, life, I had a very uh, challenging childhood with two addict parents and mm -hmm. lots of abuse. And um, I think that also uh, formed a lot of my intuitive abilities as well, because I was always tracking my parents and wondering what next crazy might be coming down pike. And mm -hmm. so it's sort of a dual duality of trauma, as well as just an innate wisdom counsel, and both kind of... Um, that took me for a ride and, and I've never, you know, uh, planned on doing this work or had some sort of agenda to become a professional intuitive and strategist and everything else that you mentioned that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, it kind of found me and it, it found me as I was trying to kind of figure myself and, and, and also handle and deal with the patterns that had been kind of wired into my psyche from the trauma I went through as a kid. And, um, so the gradual unfolding, and then there, was, there were definitely um, some moments where I would call them tipping points, where mm -hmm. I, I realized the universe was kind of saying to me, it's time for you to step into this and actually realize what your destiny is about. And I had to kind of surrender and step into those um, those doors when they opened. And um, and then it all just kind of in synchronicity led me to today, you know, and it still kind of works that way. I, I find that the next door opens um, that I couldn't have strategized on my best day, but it, in the end, I, I can see how it's like the perfect door for me to serve people through. You know, it's interesting because the great Carolyn Mace, whom you teach with, and 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 I know yeah. you're, um, you know, she's she's like my spirit animal, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Mine too. laughs> yeah. Um, she was talking about uh, we were having a recent conversation about the cape of chaos that sort of comes with our certain childhoods, right? And these capes follow us around and it's a vibration that we could, if we're unconscious, continually repeat just because it's the familiar tempo, right? So for anyone who's not doing their human homework, for anyone who's not digging under the hood and trying to get to the root of these problems on why we might create chaos in our world just because that's the familiar vibration. Or, you know, if somebody had a really abusive childhood and they're not doing their homework, they might create drama in their relationships just because, wow, well, this feels a little too comfortable. I think I need to blow this up. I'm going to throw a grenade in the room and run out and just see how that feels. And then, oh, that's familiar. I feel better now. When they don't even know, they're unconscious that this is happening. Do you think that that's the case? I, I do in part. I think that's one interpretation of, of why our systems do what they do and why people, you know, in spite of you and I, or even I, I look at myself sometimes, like, what are you doing, dude? Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> but, right. Um, you know, really? Mm -hmm. This kind of self-sabotage again? Um, but I think what's what's true is you kind of touched on it just a minute ago. It, it's really our allegiance to what we know mm -hmm. um, that I think has a lot of authority in how we decide and choose. And I also think that said, we have to look at what it is we know and what it is we know if we're coming from trauma is um, the way our psyche is adapted to meet that trauma to survive the best. And usually that's, you know, the software we kind of download and develop as kids. So I could start naming patterns like the dependent pattern or um, people that, you know, end up shifting into addiction patterns mm -hmm. to, to manage trauma. 
And it's, it's because when we're that young, we don't have any more sophistication psychologically to understand how to be with trauma. I mean, they're just, that's not, that's not available. And then right. we just transplant that into adulthood and it's the default subconscious kind of archetypal program that we have going for us. And until we are awakened to the reality and possibility that there are, there are other options, then, um, you know, we're going to keep doing what we know. And mm-hmm. so part of it is, you know, also learning that there is another way and then, and then giving that more, I think, trust that it will help you survive and thrive uh, beyond what you know, which is, you know, now I'm self-sabotaging. So mm-hmm. I look at things like that almost technically in people, you know, I, because it can baffle the, the logic mind, logical mind to go, why would you still, you know, keep doing something that's harmful or, or as you say, gr- you know, blow up the room with those grenades. Mm-hmm. Why, why do we do that? You know, mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's, the subconscious and, and where we're rooted and where we're coming from, the adaptations are so powerful, but they can be shifted, obviously. Right. I'm a living testament to that. Um, and so, uh, as are many of my clients, you know, but it, it's it's an interesting thing to understand the origins of, you know, and, and in this back then, the brilliance of the human psyche and what it developed to help you survive as a child just doesn't tend to work out in adulthood too well. It, it kind of turns in on you. And goes a different direction and, and starts to um, to kind of slowly kill you. Right, right, and that's the thing too. If you get into ugh, the cycles, I've recently met a healer. His name is Ken Wagner, and he uh, was just a regular guy on a construction site, a construction worker, and he was struck by lightning. There was a lightning strike. The transformer hit, and boom, he was blown out of his shoes, kind of. And now he's a very powerful healer. So obviously his radar is a little different because he was literally you know, right. <laughs> shocked, right? And so yeah. with that kind of trauma, a lot of times it takes a, trauma- a traumatic event to tap in, those gifts tap in. And he was talking about any relationship that we have where there's a frustration element or a cycle, right? An abuse thing possibly or... Um, maybe someone ripped you off or someone's ignoring you or someone's being combative and you just don't know why. He says, if that's the case, it's a guarantee that they, the roles were reversed in another lifetime. And that is the only reason they would feel karmically justified to treat you that way in this life. At least that's the sort of pattern that he sees in relationships. And um, so he will then go into the layers and say, how many lifetimes? Is this psychic? Is it physical? Is it emotional? And all of these different things. And it's fascinating to watch him work, right? Because he closes his eyes and his hands are kind of moving and everybody has their way. Do you believe that? Do you think that some people who give us constant challenges could be uh, this karmic dance and we have to decide if we're finished with it? Or do you think that there are just some people that come in just to teach us a lesson and help us get stronger with our emotional and spiritual muscles? You know, I, I think both are true. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't fully believe that every person that harms you, it's some past life karmic thing. Um, I think it's possible. Uh, yeah. There might be some sort of, you know, a mutual lesson that each one is on a soul contract level signed up to help each other out with. Um, But also, you know, and this is something I discovered in my work doing readings, this powerful, um, I guess best way I can language it, soul contract I've seen some people have, and it's with uh, what I named as the Bodhisattva archetype, Mm -hmm. which is in Buddhism, this being that has decided to incarnate into uh, back in the wheel of suffering, samsara, even though they've, liberated themselves from it through enlightenment and they do it to help others. So they come back to kind of absorb the pain of the world, Mm -hmm. not because it's in their classroom to, to learn that anymore. It's rather they help others, you know, learn it and get out of that classroom as well, or kind of liberate themselves. That's the idea of it anyway. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I call it the Bodhisattva contract is because there are some people and I've done readings on them that they absorb an incredible incredible amount of spring from life Mm -hmm. and and it's nothing to do with past life it's we we sort of look at karma and past lives through the lens of shame and punishment Mm -hmm. and and i don't find that to resonate with a lot of people's journeys spiritually from my eyes and what i've seen in their behind the scenes in the holograph of what makes them them and their their soul's journey Mm -hmm. sometimes we actually are here as um compassionate ambassadors of awakening for people, even though we're taking on suffering, it has nothing to do with us having earned it or paying off some karmic debt. Mm -hmm. It's rather, it's the compassionate 
action we offer to help a tipping point of enlightenment in a culture in someone's life happen mm -hmm. so that they can move on to a different classroom of more interconnection and love and nourishment and, and um, self-connection. So I, I think that that doesn't completely resonate with me. I'm sure, I do believe at the same time that mm -hmm. are um, oftentimes uh, relationship dynamics that are, let's say, uh, past life in nature. But then the other thing, just to go and thread out, a lot of times we're working through family, what I call family psychic DNA. Mm -hmm. It's just family legacy momentum that's in the psyche of the family your soul incarnated into. And it's nothing to do with past life energy. Right. Um, to say. And it's ancestral it's, uh, lineage. It's in an ancestral line. Yeah. Like cellular memory, or mm -hmm. if you, I'll talk about how we absorb, you know, the physical DNA of our family and how that helps form our biology and certain other things. But in my experience, uh, behind, you know, the, the curtain here intuitively, uh, we have psychic DNA that does the same thing to our behavior and, and our self-concept and our esteem and the way we see ourselves and the choices we make. And it's just as powerful as that physical DNA. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it's not integrated over time, it becomes physical DNA. Right. Exactly. Do you think we're hitting a tipping point in a way that we never have before because of the connectivity that we do have through um, social media and Skype and everything else that could take us all across the world? Are we getting to a place where this is now more broad stream, more because it's been going along, on for a long time. For thousands of years, people have been understanding and, and being guided by the stars and intuition. But it just seems like we here in the West are way behind the eight ball. Do you think we're having a tipping point here in the U United States? Um, of sorts, yeah. I think it's uh, any time you're about ready to, uh, let's say, tip into a new dimension of experience and potential, uh, uh, there's sort of like a, a sense of, and this is talked a lot about in mythology, um, of drag guarding that, that gateway. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, what it kind of symbolizes is that every time you move toward greater enlightenment, power, awakening, connection, you first will face what is disconnecting and um, sort of the most unconscious about you and your culture. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, we can see this very clearly with the interconnectivity and social media and the internet. It's brought out the best and worst in people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like both and 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 so to the point where you know people can manipulate perception and manipulate and trigger divis div uh, divisions and divisiveness in people. And you know, it, and it's this whole new thing mm -hmm. that wasn't able to happen before we had access to the size of people through this collective web that we call the internet. And, uh, you know, I think it requires a whole new level of psychic hygiene, psychological hygiene, and how you manage your own um, psyche mm -hmm. and, and what you put in, just like we eat food. And it's like, what do you actually let into your field through what you look at on Facebook or YouTube or anywhere? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a tipping point, but I'm not one to always go toward the, you know, sort of woo side of the new age and the millennialism that comes with these ideas of tip points, because I, I know that they usually summon the dark, you know, to a dark night right. before the dawn comes. And I think we're kind of, we're in the dark night. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear to see from, you know, just all the devastation uh, in, in terms of the world's uh, climate and it, it's just nature and animal species to everything. I mean, we're, we're in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be <laughs> quite some time before we see the light of this dark night and right. start to really dawn. You know, and, and who knows, does it have to get darker? I mean, we don't know that yet. And that kind of, I think, why well, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to, to you know, Carl Jung said, you know, enlightenment is about, um, you know, transforming dark, uh, dark figures into light through making the unconscious conscious. It's not about just imagining figures of light. I, I think that's kind of where we are. We have to, mm -hmm. we have to make our own unconscious conscious and, and then get, what is called free choice, free will, you know, back on the scene. And hopefully that's yoked to our mystical heart and, mm -hmm. and to caring of each other and, and all beings and, and kind of pivoting from there. To me, that's really what destiny in a lot, in a way is really about. Destiny's about, you know, your service to the whole uh, and the holism of, of the mystical truth that all is one. Right. Let's talk about darkness for a second, because I've had some differing theories on that. I re recently had uh, healer Pat Longo, who talks a lot about clearing your space and how you have to just get your space in 
you know, cleanse it literally with sage and Palo Santo and whatever it takes to get all the negative energy out. It's something that we should do, she says, every three months in our home, in our workspace, depending on if people come over, even cleansing the space after they leave. And then I have Mavis Patilla in here, who's from the Arthur Finley College in the UK. You know, she's like this mega medium from the UK, and she doesn't even believe in any of the darkness. She doesn't even believe in hauntings. You know, she just thinks that that's, you know. So what is your your take on cleansing our space and darkness and dark energy? Ooh, I love this question. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Um, Well, you know, I'm kind of maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, but I will say this. So, you know, there's such a, a superstitious focus sometimes on dark energy yeah, where yeah. We, we're, we feel like our, our sword of light is sage. And, and I'll tell you something, the thing that I would have people look at, I, I think, however, that ritualizing um, the movement of energy is powerful. Mm-hmm. I think if you do a ritual, uh, whether that's with sage or candles or prayer or singing bowls or you know, crystals, whatever works for you. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like a little bit of everything myself, but I don't ever pit, position myself in, I'm getting rid of dark energy. I think that actually activates it more. Mm-hmm. Anytime you relate to something in opposition, you activate it. So mm-hmm. what I would say is when you're saging or cleansing, it's more about bringing in love mm-hmm. and a, an energy that will just sort of neutralize the bad juju without this idea you got to push it out and shove it out Mm -hmm. now the other thing where i side the medium that you just mentioned is that if a ghost is haunting you for example you know this idea of saging it away and banishing it away that we see in the movies all the time right um or exorcising it somehow well that once again activates and energizes it and if you think about parts of yourself you reject the parts of you yourself you try to sage away what happens they start breathing fire yeah what? The way that you work with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a disgruntled spirit or the things that haunt you is you talk to it. You have to have a conversation with that part of yourself, that part of your psyche. Or if it were an actual ghost, the ghost is like stuck, lost, doesn't know what the hell's going on right. or doesn't know how to get to the light. Send it to the so light. I, Send it light. Yeah. Right. Bring in the light. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you, you need that spiritual uh, sort of mediation of, oh, you're stuck, you're lost. And all right, let me talk to you. What do you want from me? Mm-hmm. And what, how can I help you? And, and then it is about bringing in a mystical force to help that out. You've got to bring in the light. And the light is bigger and greater than you. So mm-hmm. that's also a metaphor for how we work with our internal dynamic being haunted, mm-hmm. um, whether it's a, a dark emotion we don't know how to be with, and that we think we got to sage out and, you know, uh, vilify instead of take in and go, what do you want from me? What do you, what's your message to me, my dear dark emotion? Right. And so I think, you know, a lot of that um, polarization that comes in our culture translates itself into spiritual ideas of, of how we keep our psychic hygiene clear. Now, I also not, uh, uh, I am going to say that you don't want to invite bad juju in your, in your field. Right. Like sometimes you got to know when you need an SPF 100, right. you know, That's and, true. and an SPF five will do just fine. You know, and you'll get a little bronzed and, and, and you get a little, you know, D going on. So there is a discernment also about, you know, not inviting bad energy into your life. Um, but at the same time, once and once it's in, how are you going to release it or neutralize it? And I, like I said, I think it's bringing in the light and, um, you know, bringing in grace, mm-hmm. not, not necessarily getting rid of it, just activate it even more. And so I'm sort of, I think it's about how you orient your intentionality in how you sage or, you know, how you deal with a ghost or how you deal with a haunting. And I mean, we can't deny uh, I, at the same time that there is dark energy, right. just right. funky vibes. And, and you can feel that on people's times. So you can see it in them. And, mm-hmm. you know, that that's real. Right. So that doesn't, that isn't where I land either. But at the same time, I think, well, do you want to, how do you want to relate to it? And it doesn't always mean you want to give it a hug. You can hug it with your mystical heart and push it out the door, you know, in a sense, with your protective hands and be like, listen, um, I'm sending you lots of love and light, but I'm also going to, you know, take you out of my space. Both can be true. And that, that's not activating it. It's, it's just saying, look, I'm not, you know, willing to let you come in and contaminate. And I wish you the most love that the universe can offer you. Right. You, know, you can so protect a boundary. You can put up a boundary with love. It's not letting them yeah. sit at your dining room table. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And think that that's the spiritual option. And that's how you get them to transition to the light. You know, uh, 
no, they may not want to go to the light. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> then know, they can like, stay in the car. <laughs> that's right. Out. You can get on out. <laughs> there's, a, knock on someone else's door. there's a great you know? book called The Tools uh, by Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels that came out in 2012. Um, where these two are therapists and they talk about how you need to look at all the parts of yourself that you don't like, right? The dark parts, the, the, right. maybe the, the bad prom experience or, you know, the kid that was picked on and <laughs> when they were seven or whatever phase you went through in your twenties or blah, blah, blah. Here you are today or whatever age you are, you have to take all those versions of yourself and make them part of your posse. So if you go into a pitch meeting, Picture all of them next to you because they made you who you are today. You can't ignore seventh grade Jen or whatever that is. You have to bring them as part of your, you know, they're your band, right? They're your theme music. And I love that visual. And I I remember telling this to a friend and she goes, well, absolutely not. I am not going to bring my second grade self. She was sad. She was, you know, she never had a lunch. She was had a skin knee. And I said, well, what you're saying is, is that if you went by a playground and you saw a seven year old with a skin knee who was crying on the playground, that you would just walk away and ignore that child. You yeah. gotta, you gotta go hold that seven-year-old self, and like you say, bring the light to them instead of uh, pretend they didn't exist. And that's, that's a lot of work, but we have to do it, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I think every part of us deserves a seat on the committee of self. That's yes. how I always think of, you know, like the round table of who we are. Mm-hmm. But the caveat is, you don't always want them making choices. You know, um, <laughs> you don't want your addict you know, running around making choices for you because we know where that goes. But it doesn't mean that you disassociate from that part of yourself, that part of yourself where you're codependent or whatever pattern in you that, you know, now you know is self-sabotaging. And there was maybe one time in your life when it saved your ass. Mm-hmm. So I always look at it like, thanks for your service. Here's your t- you know, seat at the table. You will not be kissing your vote right. in the decisions <laughs> we're going to make here. Right. But you're more than welcome to be here. Mm-hmm. And I think people mistake that accepting parts of yourself means you like them. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's parts of myself I do not like, will never like, or my history that I do not like or will never like, but I can accept them. Mm-hmm. And I know it's so important to, if I can't accept them, work with the fact that I can't accept them and accept that for now and then work my way toward acceptance somehow because I know if I until I do accept them you know, they they're going to um, influence me negatively and and the thing is those parts of you are the ones that run away with your conscious choice mm-hmm. so they end up coming out in compulsive ways you know on the on the other side of the rejection and that when we're you know befuddled like how did I even choose that or react that way what is wrong with me and then we look to that second you know itself and we're like oh it's you Mm. you needed a hug and I totally pushed you off the table and made you leave the room and you know and it's me because sometimes it's the second grade self that saves the day right you know you (laughs) yeah you know what is your um when you wake up, what is your program? What is your what is what gets you plugged in? You know, and and what is your ceremony when you start your day and your ceremony when you finish your day if you have one? Oh, I love that question. Well, I am a slow to lift off guy in the morning. Mm-hmm. I am uh, someone that really needs my time to boot up. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's always a walk with my dog for 30 minutes outside. Yes, and uh, that's the way I start my day every day. And a, a, a coffee and just kind of slowly but surely tuning back in. And I, whenever I wake up, though, I usually take like five minutes to kind of do a, um, a check in with myself. Like if I had a dream that night or what am I feeling about the day or, what, you know, where am I at? And then I kind of get up and get going um, and then start the day. Mm-hmm. And then same thing at the end of the day, but I, I work, I'll work, I'll work. And then there's, a, there's only a certain amount of bandwidth I have for this kind of work that I do professionally. Uh, it's, it, you know, I know when I'm on, and maxed out for the day. And that's when I have to go, okay, I can do any more in this lane. It's time to watch some bad TV or <laughs> it's time right. to go walk my dog again. Or And I, I'm very athletic. So I've always had, you know, some sort of athletic activity as a way to decompress or ground myself, um, have a somewhat decent meditation practice. And, uh, and, you know, just check in with myself, you know, intermittently throughout the day and, uh, take time to oftentimes just take a break every month and go on a retreat myself and, um, you know, in a cabin somewhere in the woods and, and, and kind of get back to what's going on with me and catch up with stuff that's been haunting me mm-hmm. and that I, you know, we're, we're too sped up to actually talk to, right. you know, kind of meet those ghosts and kind of go, what's up? Hey. Uh, so, yeah, there's kind of a, a, a and it's something that's still working for us for me. I mean, I think, um, you know, 
your life systems of, of self-connection and hygiene and uh, psychic hygiene or, or something that was a work in progress because, you know, things are kind of shifting all the time. So right. Right. I uh, maintain that balance. But I definitely have become much more aware of when I know I'm heading to imbalance or I'm in imbalance and when I need to course correct because I know where that can go. If, if left unattended, it's, you know, it start, starts to get, you know, funky. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I try to keep that balance going, especially when you're working within, like, as I do, the psychic psyches of other people right and i'm teaching from you know these deeper levels of of what can help transform them and holding that energy in that field in that space to teach at that level you definitely need break you know um, to kind of just have fun and remember the light and <laughs> no it's yeah. true and we get these energetic hitchhikers as Pat Longo calls them, you know, that sort of latch <laughs> on, right? And they're like, yeah. imagine it's like that boat where you have the water skier behind you and you're driving the boat. Imagine if you had like five water skiers, that boat's going to get slowed down. And I think that's kind of something that unconsciously happens. Not again to give power to the darkness, but we get these tears in our aura and these hitchhikers that show <laughs> up and, and, and they Absolutely. can really wreak havoc, can't they? Yeah. And, you know, when I work clients, I have a ritual of um, lighting a candle for them when I'm done and, and releasing their, them to their lives because I've been in their field deeply, you know, mm-hmm. and what's going on with their lives deeply for, you know, a good few hours by the time I'm done with them. And uh, I can't carry that, no. you know, so I literally, it's like deleting a file. Like mm-hmm. I just could delete it and go on my day. It's not, and it's so, so not from a non-caring place. I, there's just no way I could archive carry everybody's soul contracts and, and challenges and, and um, dynamics in my system and function. I mean, I have my own, you know, stuff to deal with. So, uh, I, yeah, I do, have a, I do have a particular ritual, and I've learned since essential as a way just to, you know, pray and, and bring the light and let them, you know, and know I've done the best I can to guide them in, in whatever time I've had them and, and then let it go. Because otherwise you do get those energetic hitters, and not because they intend to hook on or latch on. It's just what happens, especially if you're in a, a deep um, alchemy with somebody and they feel like, you know, especially when you talk to someone like me who reads you and knows stuff about you that only your friends do. Right. Um, like you're, you're their best friend, you know, <laughs> and in those moments you kind of are, but you're, you're not really, you know, and mm-hmm. um, so it's uh, important to realize, you know, that you've got a little bit of an energetic tail or connection still going on and to let that go. And I usually just, I'll focus on the things that I found in the session really intriguing because I feel like when I do readings, I'm like a reporter sometimes, and you know, I'm like getting information, but it's you know not my wisdom that's mm-hmm. necessarily coming through. It's from higher sources, and um, I'm like, wow, that's good stuff for me, right? Yeah, and, uh, or, or I'm going to teach about that. That's a cool insight, you know. So I'm always learning from people, you know, in their journeys on this planet, um, new things and. And I and I love that part of my work where I get to kind of be this reporter in the field of consciousness, like, oh, my gosh, I saw this dynamic. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know. What yeah. is your source? Do you use archangels? Do you use intergalactical? Do you go with uh, Hermes? I'm, I'm not kidding. I met a shaman who channels Hermes. What is your go to when you get ready to do, you know, your intuitive cons- uh, consultations? Is it yeah. is it just source, pure source? As some people are big Mary Magdalene fans these days. Which what's your go to? You know, I don't I don't have um I think when I pray for, for myself or for sure. other people, I'll call on other spiritual forces like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I do believe they're real that these there are spiritual forces in this incredible dynamic universe that we can call on. Mm-hmm. Um and I I'm open to all of them, you know, from the Greek and Roman gods to, uh, you know, shamanic totems to, mm-hmm. you know, all of it. Um, but I, I think any way you want to meet spirit, it'll meet you. Right. But I, I don't um, I have a, a, a sense to myself personally of my own sort of team, mm-hmm. but I don't have any special name for them or. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, you know what I mean? It's, right. me that, Call Glenn. Uh, He's taking a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Get yeah, him over here. <laughs> Um, I don't really have that. I, it's more like I, and that was something that kind of knowing they were there was something that kind of came later for me. I was like, Oh, I, I got a team here, you know, and then I'll have, I'll feel like I'll have the team of my client around me too, when I'm doing readings and stuff. So I, I, I don't get too self-concerning about, well, what's their name? I'm going to call them and what's my guide's name. And I, I mean, come on, right? you, you know, um, and, and I, but I feel, I do feel presences and I feel energy around me and I, and I have like, you know, a sense that I have a team mm-hmm. and, um, that they're helping me along. Uh, and I think that's so true because I, I also learned earlier on in my, thank God, in my intuitive, uh, career as an intuitive mm-hmm. that you, you're not always meant to know everything. Yeah. And a lot of people sort of present themselves in this 
genre of work with people that, you know, they have full access to all information. And honestly, that's BS. You don't get access to information. I think you get access to the information that's most useful, most needed, and that you yourself have the maturity and wisdom to wield. Right. So, you know, I, I, I think there's protective devices put in on how we work with folks. And I'm only interested now in what I'm here to help with. You know, I, I don't need all, and it, it'd be too much to hold in one cycle all the information of someone's whole journey and contract on the planet and beyond. Yeah. So I'm more like, what what matters right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe for the next couple of years. Right. Um, and let's talk about yeah. right now because you you did a great video that I watched on Carolyn Mace's website myss dot com. Um, that you were talking about where Scorpio was, and because I'm fascinated by astrology, but I don't know all the particulars, it was basically about its positioning. Now I'm totally going to botch this, but I remembered the date. It was by March 8th. Something had to be activated and sort of in place or at least initiated for manifesting to happen. Is that correct? Am I translating that correctly? I'll let you expand on it, but we just passed a pretty big uh, mark, wasn't it? March 8th was a pretty big deal. Well, March 8th, Jupiter went retrograde. That was it. Okay. Yeah. So astrology is, um, I feel like it's one of my best friends. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I found earlier on in my pers- of understanding myself and the world and spirituality and my, my destiny. Mm-hmm. And it was something I immediately took to. But here's the thing that I, I have a challenge with with astrology is um, most people relate to astrology from a medieval understanding of it. They're, they're thinking of astrology from the idea that planets cause things to happen. Um, and that sun sign defines their character and that they should look in books like if Scorpio's should date a Taurus, you know, and I'm going to tell you all of that is BS. Like you cannot, it's so stinky. <laughs> I can really handle it in the damn room. Um, <laughs> Good to honest. know. But so let me tell you what astrology really is from mm-hmm. my, from my point of view. And certainly, you know, anyone's uh, open to disagree with me and I've had a lot of astrologers come after me because I just don't jive with this medieval understanding when we don't live in the medieval times. No. We live in an intuitive, archetypal, and quantum age. Mm-hmm. And, and we continue to, oh my gosh, activate into this. And, and it's so exciting, the kind of um, capacities, of, capacities of transformation that we have now because of this new opening of the stuff we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. But what astrology is, nonetheless, you know, in life, I've, I've always been fascinated with fate and destiny. You know, are they the same thing? What is fate? What is destiny? In fact, I wrote a book about this. Transforming fate into destiny, everybody. Go and get it now. (laughs) Yes. Um, Because it just rivets me. And I've always had this question of what is free will in all of this, right? I mean, and all exist. We have free will. Absolutely. You know, I could have decided to do the interview or not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You could have decided to do the interview or not. Correct. But but we do have... um, places where we don't have choice. And so, you know, I can't decide I'd prefer the sun come up in the west and in the east. That's not within my purview of free will. That is a fate. We're all fated on this planet to the rotation of the earth on its axis, mm-hmm. gravity to um, what it, all these systems that were here long before we arrived on the planet that were managing and co-creating reality long before we all got here. Now, that's more, we could get the more physical level of that work. You know, we talk about planetary movement in the sun and the solar system. But there's also psychic fields of energy that uh, I would say manifest through cycles of time and patterns that we're all spaded to. Mm -hmm. So that's now we're getting to what astrology actually is. It's understanding the co-creative archetypal energetic grid of patterns that constitutes the matrix of Earth School. That is what astrology is. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're born soul fuses into that matrix Mm -hmm. we fuse into psychic weather if you want to call it that we we fuse into psychic cycles Mm -hmm. of energy and what the ancients did of course they didn't say this is not what they were doing they thought they were literally trying to understand gods and goddesses and you know they're not they're going to die right or or survive Mm -hmm. but what they were doing was they were mapping this psychic grid and through pr- what what is like a Rorschach test, like a projection of, they were watching um, inner and outer events happen in simultaneity, in synchronicity, and they started to understand the intuitively the archetypal nature of this. Mm-hmm. So they started to then name the archetypes. So in their era, they were gods, right? mm-hmm. and that's what they called them. But in our era, we understand that, at least I do, <laughs> right. that these are actually creative forces 
that are part of the creative grid of Earth. Mm-hmm. And they operate. I'm telling you, this is why I was so blown away by astrology because I didn't. I'm not someone who got into astrology because it was cool or woo woo or I wanted to be new age. I don't really roll that way, which is why Carolyn Mace and I are such good friends, right? We're, right. we're both of that gestalt of like, really? Mm-hmm. What's the bottom line here? <laughs> so uh, put the patchouli know, down. Been, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I loved her right away. I'm like, I love you. Yes. I love you. Um. So, but I'm the same with astrology as well. And astrology, you know, is it's so. Uh, empirically um, accurate when it comes to identifying timing of cycles. And I've watched thousands of you know, readings and people and myself and relatives and friends. And I can tell you, I attest to this uh, from the level of my soul to go on record and say that this works like a clock, but you have to understand what the clock is. It's not the planets causing anything. The planets, do, however, uh, symbolize a, a timing, a synchronicity, and that's what Carl Jung said, he, who, who also loved astrology, mm-hmm. uh, that this is about an inner and outer phenomena happening in simultaneity, but not because of one of one or the other. Mm-hmm. The a causal, he said, and it means that, you know. So, for example, let's let's go with Jupiter Scorpio because this is so um, in the room mm-hmm. and right now happening. So, Jupiter in October of of 2017 started to move into Scorpio from Libra, where it was last year. And at the same time, now, Jupiter didn't cause this, but it symbolizes uh, this moment where the creative psyche of Earth shifted, which means we're all embedded and connected to that, right? Because born into this field. Sure. That it's affecting us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the Me Too movement started to blow up. Mm. And Scorpio is about sexuality, power, the unconscious, the shadow, everything the Me Too movement is about. And that's just one manifestation of this archetypal, I call it an activation, something activates. And then Jupiter moving into Scorpio just symbolizes it. Right. Doesn't cause it, but symbolizes it. And I can't explain how or why that works, but I'm telling you, it absolutely does. Mm -hmm. And so it sets up this, and it wasn't that out of nowhere, the Me Too movement happened. We have to go back and realize this, and all cycles are connected in the continuum. The Me Too movement was on the heels of the Cosby expose yes you know there were other things that were building up to this for quite a while for a good year Mm -hmm. but at that exact moment tipping point for it came and boom same at the same time jupiter went right into scorpio and i'm telling you jennifer i could go cycle after cycle event after event and coordinate the archetypal alignments Mm -hmm. to a t it blow your mind it blows my mind and so then you know so just on march 8th just just now, mm-hmm. uh, we've got Jupiter going retrograde in Scorpio. And what that means, all that Jupiter built up up until March 8th, since this fall, mm-hmm. is now going to even get more revealed, even deeper. More more things are going to come forward. And not just like more about the Me Too movement, it's about all of this. So look at the Trump scandal with Stormy Daniels, right on the retrograde. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's just another symbol of there's this whole thing in the culture that we are needing to go into to go to our new uh, a new level of potential as a culture and as individuals mm-hmm. and there's complications in the media movement what about the people that accuse uh someone of sexual harassment of lying right because that is going to happen right. you know what about well, there's other questions there's deeper questions as to we can you know vilify and make wrong all the all the um uh, the people that have transgressed and harassed and i would never make that right right but at the same time isn't there a deeper question beneath that behavior Right. Beneath those, I'm more curious as to what makes people do that. Men or you know? women, because now there's yeah. men coming forward that were me too. It's not just about the women saying, hey, I put up with this for decades. It's going both ways. Yeah, I was sexually harassed at my last publisher. Yeah. You know, somebody many times and in front of other authors. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, I mean, I'm just like, you know, this is definitely mm-hmm. something that does, that crosses gender lines. I mean, it definitely, I would say statistically more slants toward women. There's just no denying that because of the patriarchy patriarchal nature of the culture and you know the way men are um, raised in their insecurity about their the feminine half of their psyche and being confident in their manhood in a different way that doesn't split them up and make them want to go disempower women to feel powerful Mm -hmm. because it's about power you know it's not about sexuality you know any sexual transgression of that nature um, is is, isn't about eroticism per se it's about someone's wiring around power and their esteem and, and their sense of prowess 
So, um, yeah, I mean, th- I could go on and on, but there's well, what else be, so- for 2018? What other things are you seeing astrologically that w- w- will start in, you know, get going into motion with other planets that are big ones, you know, that we could, like you say, they're not causing certain things to happen, but certain temperatures will be taken. Yeah, it's psychic weather. That's why mm-hmm. I look at it. I'm like, okay, is, here comes the hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's building up right. it's in the Gulf right now, mm-hmm. but it's heading to the shore. Right. Um, and it really is like that. Yeah, so Jupiter is going to definitely be a big one. That, and, and the retrograde of that goes until uh, G- July um, 10th. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be in this for four months. And then there's Mercury retrogrades that happen, and they're very similar in that sense of all the retrograde supplies, really, all of them on all the planets do this, is something in the unconscious is needing to be made conscious. And anytime we wake up to something, it's usually a messy process. Mm-hmm. So most of us wake up through, you know, getting a two by four. Yeah. Smack on our head. What was that? Right. You know, and um, and some people don't even ask that question. They just kind of go, oh, that hurt and keep going and then get the next one, you know, until they finally realize, well, maybe, maybe I should stop walking where they're swinging two by fours. There's something going on here. <laughs> um, you know, right. but, uh, yeah, to your, to your point. Um, yes, there are other massive. Th- this is what I call a fate destiny. Year. And what I mean by that, there's so many other cycles going on. We'll, we could be I have two hours talking about it. But to sum it up, there is in this year, 2018. Um, uh, uh, coming to terms at the bottom level of karma with certain uh, social, cultural patterns, sociocultural patterns Mm -hmm. that we need to address if we want to move to new potential as a world. And so I'll speak on the behalf of the United States as a country. Mm -hmm. And what one of the other cycles that's going to really, I think, bring this to bear is Saturn and Capricorn, which just moved to Capricorn in December, and it's going to be there for two and a half years, but it will go great in April in Capricorn. And, and, and this to me is about, we have, you know, we can have, you, know, you can watch on the news right now and see all this political spin and spell and everyone ta- over talking things sometimes like they constantly do, in my opinion, on CNN. they just overanalyze this and that and this and that, and they miss other news that really matters. And mm-hmm. then you go to Fox news and it's, it's a whole, kind of, from my point of view, way of looking at reality through a certain lens to protect tribalism that they, you know, empower over there for the political right. Mm-hmm. And everything's filtered through that kind of divisive tribalism and, and therefore the news follows suit. Well, you know, we can do that forever mm-hmm. and watch the Rome burn. But at the same time, the point is Rome is burning. And so, you know, can't escape basic karmic results. Karma just does what it does. It doesn't care if you're Democrat or Republican. It doesn't care any of that. These are just sort of universal, even I'd say mystical laws in motion Mm -hmm. that are there for us to learn and and wake up from. So, you know, we we are guilty to some degree, think of our bias and our tribalism and our our positioning into what truths are convenient for us and, and staying away from the ones that aren't. And and at the end of the day, karma keeps churning. Mm-hmm. So I have a feeling the fate and destiny year, one of the threads of it is lots of karma that's just irrefutable. And if you don't get on board with realizing the consequences of certain cycles, energies, um, political positionings, uh, then then you just keep suffering until you finally do get on board with it and go, wait a minute, maybe one of the ways we stop school shootings is through different gun laws. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because the ones we have now, they just keep producing this karma. Right. That's just what's true. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no spin to that. It's not an NRA point. It's, 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 this is, this is just the cause and effect. Equation. It's, yeah. Equation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a karmic equation. Mm-hmm. And then you go to other countries that don't have similar, you know, laws um, and, and gun issues. And you go, well, why, why do they have different karma like mm-hmm. Australia? Huh. Right. Okay, well, they got rid of the guns. That's interesting. I mean, you know. So. I was in the UK, and the police officers have clubs. They don't even have guns. I'm like, oh, you know, and that's that's we just the way it is. The rest of the world, we look like mad, a mad circus to the rest. I mean, I was just, yep. I go to Europe all the time, and, and when you look back over the sea, you're like, oh, poor America. Yep. You know, I mean, and, and I don't, I love my country. I love everyone, and I love everyone here. I mean, yep. I think everyone has a right to be here, and I, everyone's point of view is valid in, in, in the way it's valid, but karma is karma Mm -hmm. so there is that kind of in motion this year um that kind of karmic momentum building yeah and i think that's with saturn and capricorn the next two and a half years going to be very interesting to see because there's a lot of stuff down in the fall in synchronicity with our election cycle i mean and i looked ahead and i was like "Ooh, november holy crap all the different activations through the planets Mm -hmm. and i was like 
oh, wow, this is going to get real. So, <laughs> Does the planet say real. anything about whether Trump's going to have two terms or is that, I know because I know this is all karma. This is all, you know, we're here this, because of what no, happened. But, you know, I'm just yeah. curious. Um, I, I would find it um, incredibly unlikely that mm-hmm. he would even get through the rest of this term for the most part, because there's just, you know, the way I look at it this way, I mean, I, cause I, I, uh, I, I obviously I'm a registered independent, by the way, I, I don't side with the party cause I know better to get into that polarity. If you're right. in that polarity of tribalism, you're already screwed as right. far as I'm concerned. You're, you're likely not thinking for yourself. Right. Um, you are, you know, triggered and, and, and spun by mm-hmm. political base. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to then make the most holistic, intuitive, heartfelt, mystical choices about, Know, policies and what policies you vote for and support and the candidates that can carry the torch for that. Right. So I'm not a fan of the two party system at all. I think it's part of the sickness that we're in as a, a dysfunctional a culture. Having said that, um, you know, I do think that don't I, I, it's like living in this question. Don't we as Americans deserve better politicians, period. I mean, we're like battered wives. We're like, well, that one's good enough. I so know, I guess right. it's worth them, even though they keep beating me up. Right. You know, and, and I just think to myself, you poor people. I mean, don't you think you deserve someone better than a Trump, than you know, anyone right. that is currently in the bought out Congress and, you know, and, and these things that are just true, folks, they're just true. And don't we deserve better? Don't, I mean, don't you deserve better Republican representatives? Mm-hmm. Don't you deserve better Democrats? Don't you deserve a few independents that have some backbone and muscle to kind of pull us out of that polarity? And don't you think, think that this is happening because this is the pendulum swing so far in one way? It has to go back the other. You know, I mean, I, I, because like you said, we are all one. So, you know, Dr. Mary yeah. Neal, who had the near-death experience, I interviewed her a few times, and she talks about when she was in heaven and she looked down and she saw that this is an oriental rug and we're all connected. And from up there, it looks beautiful. But we need the light and the dark. So Trump and Hillary, sorry to tell you, you're part of the same rug. <laughs> it That's is. True. Yeah, yeah, you know, and the thing is, well, maybe, maybe the question is this. Mm-hmm. Why don't we look at the pendulum swing itself? Right. Why do we have to keep swinging? Maybe we can come to an equilibrium where we don't swing to such extremes, because mm-hmm. that I think is also endemic the problem of, of the polarized um, political groups of Democrat versus Republican. What if we actually had a really good independent party mm-hmm. that stopped that pendulum from going wacko and into territory that, you know, there's some bottoms you don't come back from. Right. And that people need to realize and remember that because I remember, you know, people were, you know, dumping uh, Hillary and voting Trump because just out of protest voting or not voting at all or whatever. And I thought, you don't get there's some bottoms you don't come back from. That's right. I mean, ask, ask any dead addict mm-hmm. about that. And and you'll realize that, you know, be careful because there are bottoms we will not come back from as a nation. We have hit some bottoms already. And I don't think people realize because most Americans never leave the country. They're American centric in their in their worldview. Mm-hmm. They don't understand that. Speaking of tapestry, this whole country is woven into the tapestry of a world right. now. Right. You know, and people want to, what go back to the tribalism of nations. Well, guess what? Walk around the living room, and why don't you take an inventory of everything in it? And I'm going to tell you, by the time you're done, you're going to realize the whole world is in your living room because someone in China made your chair. Mm-hmm. Someone in Thailand made a lamp that's lighting your room. Someone made, you know, someone in India made your rugs. Right. Keep going. And then we'll talk about how you want it to be just America first. Because guess what? Too late. The tipping point. And that's an archetypal movement of the earth itself. Mm -hmm. We've always been one world. The difference now is we are conscious of it. You can't reverse awareness and go, well, I don't want to be one world anymore. And that goes back to looking at all the parts, your dark parts, that you need to sage. You know, we have to look at it all. And we have to be honest about what it is and say, oh, look at that. Look what I did there. Look at that. All those people voted that way. Look at that. And then acknowledge it. And like you say, get that pendulum. I love that visual, Robert. Thank you for that. The pendulum doesn't have to swing extremes one way or the other. It can sit there in the middle. And let's talk about how we can get that energy solid. That's, I think, that that's, I think, is when I mean, you, you saying that back to me just made my heart come online. I mean, it just makes me feel like, God, really, that just feels like a breath of something new. 
Mm-hmm. You know, um, this isn't about so everyone's like already clamoring to go to the Democrats in the next election, um, right. which I in my, you know, political, uh, I would say, and just values, my human values, I, they, I'm more identified with Democrats and Republicans generally. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm like a little weary of that. I'm like, you know, not so fast. We're, let's get an independent grassroots movement going here. Let's just hop over to the next pendulum. Let's do something new. Mm-hmm. And and then something new can happen and it'll jam a whole system. If there's someone that's just from the outside, that's independent, that's not part of all the whole Mass. crazy mm-hmm. that really is on the behalf of the people from the grassroots funded from the people, right. that's the person I think that's going to kick some butt and change things for real. Yeah. You know, and so um, anyway, this is my. No, my I own. love that. I love that. Well, I'm so grateful we got to talk. Before I let you go, I want to ask you something. And, and this is something that's difficult for me as an author because I think about some stuff that I wrote about, gosh, you know, in 1998, me, that I no longer completely believe in. And I wonder if there's anything that, that maybe once used to be part of your compass, Robert, that now has shifted that you want to oh. make sure people know about. I love your question. Okay. This is probably my favorite one of the whole interview. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, there okay. is. Okay. You know, so it, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to speak through like just, you know, because just like anyone who's probably listened to this, um, just like you, uh, just like me, I'm, and my point is to say that I am a seeker. I've always been a seeker. I've always had a fascination with, you know, what's beneath the surface of why we're here. I've been an art, you know, student and seeker of different spiritual philosophies, and even you know, earlier on religions. Yes. Um, so I, I'm, you know, well studied in a lot of different stuff because I just found it all interesting, and I was always asking questions and, you know, looking for answers. And and um, I think when I started to shift in, in the twenties, say the nineteen ninety eight, you, because that's about when I was really <laughs> on fire, you know. And, yeah. and I found Charles Mace's work, and I was like, oh, I love her. And you know, Gary Zukav's books and other mm-hmm. people's books at the time, and whatever was on Oprah's show and right. you know, uh, everyone yeah, I was eating it up mm-hmm. um, but I have to say you know I as I've done readings now and now that I've kind of gotten into a different zone of my own seeking a lot of my my insights just come from my work sure. um, working with people you know mm-hmm. it's not reading books per se I'm always happy to learn from a great teacher um, I feel like if you're a teacher yourself uh, you know you're also forever a student or, mm-hmm. or you calcify you know out of the teacher role into something else that I think isn't um, as uh, dynamic as, as being a real live present teacher. Yes. Um, so I'm always absorbing and learning and yet a little more shrewd in what I let in and, and believe in anymore because it just doesn't match my own experience. And I would say to anyone, you know, if you want to know if something's true, always consult your own experience because that's always going to be your own teacher. But there's that said, there's just a lot of stuff I used to read and spiritual outlet books and stuff that I've now come to realize comes from, and, and you kind of hinted at this in some of the questions you asked earlier, the, you know, around, you know, energy and dark energy and mm-hmm. you know, getting rid of it and sm- saging and smudging. Uh, I would never now underestimate the influence of shame in how we perceive spiritual philosophies and the ones we even create. Mm. Because I've learned that we have this way of approaching spirituality that's about becoming a better person, living a better life being better, 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 as if the person we are right now with our flossomeness, all of the effed upness of us, all of the crazy isn't enough. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and what I would say is what I've learned and pivoted from is I no longer will go near any spiritual philosophy and give it any, let's say, time if I smell shame in it. Mm-hmm. And I can go back to the books on my shelf that come from 1998 and now read them and see shame everywhere. Wow. You know, um, well, so for example, you know, Gary Zukav used to talk about in Seed of the Soul, which then was like a Bible to me. Yep. About how animals on a soul level of hierarchy are, are trying to graduate up human incarnation. And I can't think of any other p- bigger piece of crap. <laughs> because I'm telling you right now, my cat is one of my incarnated master guides, and she is on my ass when I'm about ready to make a bad decision. Right. <laughs> you know, I, looks at me, and she's like, really? You're going to do that again? Yes, you know yes. I mean? I'm like, okay, fine, I won't. <laughs> um, but my point is, you know, or elephants or dolphins, these, these beings on the planet that I think carry the wisdom of the whole Earth's memory and, and heart and soul in it. and 
Totally. And to assume that somehow on a soul level, they're lesser. It's that whole dominator model. It's the filter of the patriarchy. It's the shame. And this idea that spirituality is this journey of perfection of the soul is perfectionism in spiritual language. It's, and it's perfectionism is a pattern that we all have in our psyche as a way to combat and defend against shame. Right. What I've really learned, and it's, it was a huge pivot for me around 2013, 2012, 2011, somewhere in there, there was a few years where I just really started to get that so much of our ideas of spirituality are, are violent to our nature mystically, yes. which is to say they violate this fundamental truth that I've come to know is that we are already enough, will always be enough. There is evolution of the soul. I think there's evolution of humanity. Right. That is true but has nothing to do with worthiness. Nothing. Right. So even the law of attraction, positive affirmation philosophies are all about be positive, good things will happen. It's shame-based. Mm -hmm. But you can't have a bad mood. You can't have a bad dark night. You can't have a depressed creative depression cycle. That is part of creativity. Absolutely. You, you can't have these things and, and attract good things. That's BS. I've had great things happen to me, even though I'm, sometimes in the most negative cycle ever. <laughs> you, know totally. I mean? you know, and you that's know, the other thing too, is that we, that helps propel the, the, I would say misguided belief that you can't, you've got to get it out. Right. I mean, like you say, we have to walk through it. We cannot ignore it and bring it up. Oh, I'm not feeling that way. Let's just push it down, push it down, push it down. And I'll do all my affirmations and I'll do my vision board with all of my houses and all of the stuff and the cars and the, and then it'll all be okay. And I just think to myself, how many, <laughs> how many arts and craft stores I went to with these damn vision boards thinking that that was going to make it all better. Me too. Oh my and gosh. You know, and, and it was all this, this grasping effort to get to being enough. Right. Right. You know, it's all about, I want to be enough and okay, well, what's the secret to being enough? I'll buy that book and figure it out. You know, and it's just like by the, by the day you're still in the loop. It's a shame hamster wheel. Right. Instead of just going, you know what, I'm enough now in anything I do to refunctuate my life or my psyche or, you know, shift the pattern here or there is to express the worth I already have. It's not about getting to that worth. It's to move the furniture a little differently so I can express it a little more directly and in service to my fellow human being. That to me is the real path is, you know what, I've got to just start to somehow come to know, I call it soul esteem, mm -hmm. my own intrinsic worth that's always been there, always going to be there, can't be diminished, is going to be around. And how do I, you know, make a connection to that that lets that esteem activate my life more? Because the thing is, you know, we're always I, we're always going to, you know, be as human beings mm -hmm. struggling with our wounded ego esteem. Of course, you know, I I, I still do just because I know these things doesn't mean like I'm constantly in solace and have it activated 24 seven. That's not true at all. I visit right? you know, and it's a nice time <laughs> um, and it's wonderful, but, and I know it's there, mm -hmm. but I'm still just like everyone else having to kind of go in and, and question intentions. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I saying this? Is this to get to enough or is to express how I already am enough? Mm. What's going on here? And even with that, you can't be a perfectionist because then you're back into the shame. So I... this interesting thing that I really feel Frank runs rampant in spirituality and self-help. Yeah. It sells a lot of books to keep people on that wheel. It does. It's, and it's judgment yeah. too, which is my other big years of shame. And I, I, I go back and I read these, oh, and there's so much judgment layered in. Like if you're not doing this, then you're not getting there and you're not, you're not honoring where people yeah. are in their journey. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you're human too. Yay. <laughs> hey, welcome to the party. Welcome <laughs> to the human party. If people want to get an intuitive consultation with you, Robert, are you, do you have a waiting list for like five years or can they go to com? Yeah. and are, is it yeah. pretty long? Well, you know, the way that I do it now, because I had a waiting list for a long time and it's, it got crazy. Yeah. Um, and I don't honestly do a lot of intuitive readings anymore just because I've moved on to teaching more. Sure. And, and, and I find that's a more impactful way to reach people mm -hmm. at a price point most people can kind of get into. Got it. Um, so you can certainly always look out for what I'm up to in that regard on my website. But if, if there is a, an opening, the best way to go is to my website, ohato.com, O o h o t t o dot com, mm -hmm. um, and just see under the consultation section, which is going to be redone soon, by the way. Um, okay. If there's any opening, and if you see it sold out, that means I'm just I'm, I'm sold out. There's not a lot going on, which it normally is, honestly. Mm -hmm. But they can also um, 
you know, email consultations at ohada.com and say, listen, if you ever have openings, can you just email me? And we do try to do that. We try to just send out a mass email to everybody like, look, they're open, go for it. And they're usually gone like in a day whenever I do open them. So I wouldn't hesitate when people right. <laughs> want to get it. But, but yeah, um, and you know, I do vlogs. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I love your vlogs. For anyone who hasn't gotten on board with those, go to ohado.com, check them out. You can also go to mace.com where a lot of your vlogs are. That's M-Y-S-S.com. Yeah. And you're also on yeah. Soul Connections Radio and your book, Transforming Fate into Destiny. Because people, it is a fate destiny year. You heard it here from Robert. Yes, it is time yes, to activate your destiny. And... Um, also to honor where you are on this journey in getting to your destiny. So we honor everyone on their journey where they are. Um, Robert, so grateful for the time and the conversation. I hope this isn't our last chat because I so enjoyed your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Oh, man, are you something to be, um, you're an inspiration to many, uh, myself included, and to all, hopefully, who are listening today. So go ahead and get tuned in and tapped into uh, Robert's work. Get the book, Transforming Fate into Destiny, and put that one on your nightstand immediately. And please, as you stay spiritual on your journey, treat others the way you'd like to be treated. I'm Jennifer Weigel, and you can find out more about me at jenweigel.com. And for all of you listening, stay spiritual, damn it. Stay spiritual, damn it. A spiritual 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 damn it.